Hi there, good afternoon. Welcome to Mosley Learning Challenging Conversations. This is the fourth challenging conversation in our series. In these topics, we take some of the most important issues and challenging issues in mental health today. And we love bringing together leaders who have been campaigning on issues for a long time, highly effectively, but also we really welcome new young dynamic leaders who are coming with all their perspective and their kind of generations, uh, ways of describing things. So today we are talking about black and minority ethnic communities equalities. We are dedicating this session to talking about particularly people who have mental health difficulties and come from, live in the black, Asian and minority ethnic communities. We have a great opportunity. COVID has really brought the issues of inequalities into stark relief. But this is not the first time we have been having these discussions certainly across the 40 years I've worked in the, in the public service system. So this time, are we going to have a different approach? Are we gonna look at this in a different way? Are we going to have different conversations? Have we got actions that we think will mean that this is an issue that doesn't go away? What are our ideas about practical, dynamic, real improvement and action? So I'm going to start by getting our, each one of our panelists, five very dynamic panelists, to introduce themselves. And then I'm going to ask each one of them in turn to tell us what do they see as the top issues in the subject of black, Asian and minority equalities, communi ethnic communities and equalities that we should be addressing in mental health services today and going forward across their lives. So can I start by asking Myra, can you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Geraldine. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Myra Khan. I work as a counsellor, therapeutic coach and supervisor. And I'm also the founder of the MCAPN, which is the Muslim Counsellor and Psychotherapist Network. Thank you. Adi, over to you. Do introduce yourself. I think you're on mute, Adi. Good afternoon, everybody. My, my first lesson in technology. Um, nice to see you all. Um, my name is Yitende Ade Serrano. I'm a counseling psychologist. I'm also the current chair of the Division of Counseling Psychologists. I'm the founder of the Black and Asian Counseling Psychology Group. I work as a, a, a practitioner, but also do teaching. Um, I'm a supervisor, I'm a mentor, um, and many, many other things. Fantastic to have you, Addy, just in your second live media showing, as I understand it. Great. Okay. Alison, can I get you to unmute and tell us, just do introduce yourself. On mute, yeah. Am I still on mute? No, you're great. Hi, everyone. My Good. name is Dr. Alison Edwards. I'm an SD6 psychiatrist in general adult psychiatry here in South London and the Maudsley Trust. I'm also one of the steering group members in the um, SLAM Cultural Psychiatry Group, which is newly launched this, this month. So I'm really mm. happy and pleased to be here. Great. Lovely to have you. Arling, do take yourself off mute and introduce yourself. Good afternoon everyone, my name is Arlene Elson. I work at SLAM as the EDI and HR lead and have been in the organisation for 18 years. Great, Thank welcome. And finally, probably needs no introduction to most people watching, Raj Mohan. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Geraldine, and thank you for asking me to this. My name is Raj Mohan. I, um, I'm a, a psychiatrist who worked in SLAM since my training days, and it's now totaling over two decades. Um, I work in rehabilitation and social psychiatry, and I think the hat that I'm going to wear today is one of social psychiatry rather than rehabilitation. Um, I'm also the chair of the Faculty of Rehabilitation and Social Psychiatry at the Royal College, and I was appointed as one of the two new presidential leads 
for Race and Equality at the Royal College, which is planning to uh, create an action program to tackle um, all forms of inequality, including racism. Thank you so much, Raz. Fabulous to have you. So can I start with asking Adi to, Adi, tell us, why did you come on the Challenging Conversations series? We're so pleased to have you. What are the top ways in which you think we should be thinking about and tackling this whole issue of inequalities in people from the different communities? Um, for me, and one of the reasons um, I'm attending today, is um, the relevance and importance of have, having open dialogue. Um, I think that for many years, and, and as some of the panelists have, have mentioned earlier, we, you know, I've been certainly involved in this conversation for over 10 years, so the conversation isn't new to me. However, I, I think there is a... There is a, a, a tendency for us not to be talking openly about this. So we talk about it in, in our various groups and you know the various committees that we might sit on, but we don't actually have you know challenging conversations where we challenge each other to um, think about alternatives, way, ways of discussing this, and and being open about the discussion rather than um, putting up uh, putting up a political face or jumping on the bandwagon because we feel that we, we have to be seen as, uh, as doing something. Um, one of the other reasons is I think a lot of us use um, language that is current at the time and quite understandably so because we want people to be able to understand what we're saying. So we talk about things like diversity, we talk about things like inclusivity, but actually we're not specific about what we mean by these terms. So inclusivity, what does that really mean? Diversity, what does that really mean? You know, are we talking about racial diversity? Are we talking about cultural diversity? Um, you know, we need to be more specific. Um, the other thing that I, you know, I, I would really hope that we touch on today is, is, is around tokenism and the need for institutions and or individuals um, to feel like they need to say something uh, as a gesture. And um, that doesn't really go down well for me. Um, it doesn't work for the people that look like me, certainly not that I, you know, I, I'm not an expert on every black woman um, in the world and I cannot speak to each and every black woman's experience. Um, the other thing that's important to me is about history. You know, we have a factual history, but actually everybody interprets that history um, based on their own experience and therefore, we, we, we kind of accumulate histories and assume that that is, you know, applicable to everybody, and it isn't. Um, there's a lot more that I'm interested in, but I'll stop there. That's great. So your call to us <clears throat> is to be open in this discussion, to challenge constructively, thinking about how do we take this forward? And I really love your challenge to organisations, organisations that will call this out that don't actually have an action plan with measurable improvements to, to kind of sign up to. So great way to start the, the, the program. Thank you, Adi. Myra, your perspective. I, th I think for me, and it kind of follows on really for, for, from what, what Yutunde is saying, I, I, as a visible Muslim practitioner, I naturally attract into my private practice then a lot of Muslim clients. And if I was to say that I own, or that I work with Muslim clients, and I was then to treat them in that homogenous way, then I would fall very short of the work that I'm trying to do with them. And I think one of the biggest failings when it comes to mental health services are then the challenges and the barriers that are created by homogenizing the communities that we actually do want to reach out to and work with and support. So. Even having that direct experience of working across lots of different ethnic minority and diverse communities, the moment we try to label them based on either their culture or an ethnicity or faith, I think we're actually losing their real identity. And that then stops people from actually being able to access appropriate culturally sensitive and faith sensitive services, which leads on to the second point that I think, again, is going to be possibly something that many of us are going to be talking about today, is the use around intersectionality and understanding our complex, intricate identity, lived experience and truth, and to honour that and respect that in our clients and what they then need from us. Which for me then really starts to pick apart and challenge the use of the term BAME, BAME or BME, which does the complete opposite, which is to 
homogenize and create in a silo and in and under this huge umbrella term then every single individual that would that would otherwise fall under that that kind of very large umbrella term of black asian minority ethnic and for any service then that's trying to reach out and work with anybody any single client from any of those communities um creates then a service that in trying to meet the needs of everybody fails to meet to, fails to meet the need of any single person and that just creates a vicious cycle for which then services are being created with that in mind, but then doesn't actually meet the needs of anybody. So I think that is something that I would really like us to talk about today as well. Okay, so the whole issue of is BAME actually as a term holding us back? Does it mean we are tending to bring people together as if it's one homogenous group when there are such major cultural differences? And perhaps we could also raise later the issue about cultural, different cultural attitudes to the stigma of mental health and people's willingness and ability to access services. Thank you. We will definitely come back to your challenges, keep them alive. And uh, I'm sure panel members are already thinking about responses. That's completely great. Um, could I then come on to um, Arlene? Arlene, what, what would you like to, to bring to the fore in your, in your five minutes? Um, I'd like to, um, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation for um, coming along to speak today. But I, I'd like to focus on um, us really looking and accepting that we do have a racial problem. There is a, an issue in the organisation and um, actually... If we don't acknowledge it, how can we then move forward and, and come up with actions to deal with it? So I, I think having these conversations to really openly say, are we um, institutionally racist or not? Have that discussion. And if we are, agree, how are we going to move forward? And also, it's really important to talk about power, the shifting of power, and also... Um, uh, you know, I'm going to say white fragility. Um, we had a conversation in our time to talk um, two weeks ago, and it was really important to bring that out and to uh, um, acknowledge that there is white power and um, there's nothing wrong with having power, but it should be shared equally and it isn't. So it's about touching on that and having us to listen, accept and, and move forward, actually. Okay, thank you. So. I suppose we're talking about is BAME not a good term because it, it masks different, really important yeah. cultural differences. Is white also not a good term because it certainly also masks significant cultural differences and power levels based on kind of people's context. And so what in a sense you're raising is the issue of to what extent uh, is this whole inequalities for people from different communities is it about the local community context in which they live? Is it about their personal circumstances mm -hmm. and access to opportunities? Is it about the way their attitude to services and how services respond? Mm -hmm. You raise some really, really important issues for us to try to get to the bottom of. And we would love as this conversation goes on to hear more about this fantastic initiative that I think I feel really proud as a director on the board of SLAM that the organization has done, which is to have the time to talk conversations where people can talk about the real things that are happening to them and have happened. Brilliant initiative. Thank you. Raj, could I come to you next and just ask from your perspective, newly appointed with a national leadership role in this issue, what are you, what is your particular focus that you want, want to have? Uh, thank, thank you, Geraldine. I, I was thinking that in terms of, you know, people who work in mental health are first and foremost, the duty is to, people who come to us with mental health needs. And we are all painfully aware of um, ethnic inequalities. Um, and I want to say racial inequalities in mental health problems that they face, but they also face problems in terms of accessing services, not enough people access services in the right way at the right time. When they come into hospital, they have different experiences of care. More people from Black African, Black Caribbean, uh, communities are detained under the Mental Health Act. So we know all of these things. The outcomes are not as good as the other groups. So I don't think we need to debate at all whether there are ethnic or racial inequalities in terms of um, uh, more negative outcomes for people from minority ethnic groups. We certainly know that. 
um, we can improve our services to provide everyone with the highest level of care or the best possible care that we can think of. But unless we prevent the excess number of people being detained under the Mental Health Act, we're not going to make a point. So the answer to the theme of today, which is, are we doing enough? I think has to be a resounding, we're not doing enough. And we're not targeting the right area. So when you look at somebody who's presented in crisis, whether they end up being detained in hospital or not, is, is a time that you really don't have a lot of choices. Somebody is very unwell and they need to come into hospital. But where we really need to think about is the months and years prior to that, when they've had negative experiences, when they've had all the risk factors operating that led them to that point. And psychiatry has unfortunately not been good at um, prevention and addressing those kind of social factors. I think that's partly because of how we are configured. We are uh, people who live and work within mental health services. We actually don't do enough of um, public mental health work. Also within our own practice, we're not that good at asking people about the trauma and experience they've had prior to becoming unwell. Like how many people ask about racial trauma or how many people ask about other forms of minority stress? For example, if you're LGBTQ individual, what kind of trauma and negative experiences have you faced in your life? We don't really ask those questions and we should be asking that. And I'd say this as a social psychiatrist because social determinants are such an important aspect of our everyday practice. It is real lives for people. And when you want people to return to communities, you really want to adjust those things. So I think I want to focus on all the factors that get people into mental health care and disproportionately for people from ethnic minority groups. So thank you so much, Raz. So, so what we've had from panelists, we're going right from Myra and Yutunde talking about understanding the communities and the cultures to Raj focusing on a subject very, very dear to my own heart, which is about the rates of detention under the Mental Health Act, amputating people's liberties, which sometimes may seem like the right thing to do under the law, but actually taking away people's liberties, long detentions in institutions, and what exactly are the outcomes. So we're, we've got quite a spectrum of things we want to cover today, which is great. And so can I come to Alison, budding new, terrific generation of young psychiatrists in training coming forward. Alison, one of the questions that's come up on the chat Hannah asked us is, so what, how do we need to train the practitioners of the future inside the psychiatry world? Are you being trained in the right way? What else would you like? What are your kind of thoughts on this? Thank you, Geraldine. And I think it's really important to bring that perspective from training uh, into this conversation, because I remember I, I studied medical anthropology about nine years ago, and I was looking at these this disproportionate amount of black men in particular having diagnoses of schizophrenia and psychosis and the rates of detention being significantly higher. And I fast forward that nine years down the line into my psychiatry training, and it feels like it hasn't significantly changed. And I was almost doing a thought experiment with myself and I was thinking, if I imagined I was in um, a country in Africa where the black majority population and I went onto one of their inpatient wards and all I saw was white faces, white people being detained, I feel like there would be maybe more of a sense of outrage or wanting to talk about this issue more. And I think as trainees, that's something we need to not get used to, not get used to this as being what our wards need to look like, but actually this is something that we need to tackle and we need to be able to address and speak about. And I guess also thinking from a trained perspective, thinking about how that affects trainees who might be consider themselves black, Asian or other might ethnic minority groups, how does that impact us seeing that? Because I guess for me, that was quite fragmenting. How do I work in an organization where these inequalities, health inequalities exist uh, and don't seem to be significantly changing? And I think in terms of what, what we need to be doing is, uh, as I think Ali mentioned, is having these conversations, talking about race, talking about culture, talking about those power dynamics, how we are, we are seen as psychiatrists um, and how the community may view us. And obviously that's not gonna be one single view, but that's gonna come from a range of different perspectives. Yeah. And, and I guess in our training, we learn about these negative outcomes. But we don't often learn about what are we doing about it? 
And I think as trainees, we need to be thinking about that bigger picture. We need to be thinking about racism, how that affects um, people in uh, black communities. I'm saying black because that's what I see a lot in our inpatient wards, um, how that impacts their mental health. Like Rajev, why are we not asking about that as part of our history taking? Um, because that clearly has an impact in terms of how they're accessing services and how they're engaging with treatment. And I think it's really important for us not to be putting, locating the problem within the communities and just thinking about, oh, you know, mental health is just stigmatized, that's why they're not coming, but thinking about what do we need to do as an organization to make sure that we are being inclusive, making ourselves accessible for all, all of the population that we serve. And I think speaking from that as well, thinking about really co-production, because when I came to SLAM, when I applied, I knew it as this world-renowned institution that's doing this amazing research, and it is doing this amazing research. Um, but when I started to speak to members of the community, I noticed that actually they were telling me that they feared this organization. They were worried. They didn't trust it. And actually, we need to break down those barriers. We need to be making sure that they're inputting, they're, they're letting us know as trainees, what, what do you want from us? How do you want us to be responding? Because actually, if we're not changing the way we're looking at the situation from a trainee and psych as a psychiatrist who are involved in doing things uh, like detaining people, formulating treatment plans, um, making these decisions, because we are in a position of power and recognizing that, um, and we need to be taught about that in our training. We need to be thinking about that and having that broad view of where we fit within the society that we serve. Fantastic. Real call to action and real call to... I mean, I think what I get from the panel is just the sheer depth of all your thinking. And I think if we brought all your ideas together and views and we systematically went through an improvement plan, that would be kind of pretty amazing. So let me start by asking, uh, many of you have raised the issue one way or another about the communities and about should we be educating, for want of a better word, should we be trying to communicate more with communities, should we be trying to engage more with communities? Other people will say things like, but we're not commissioned to do primary prevention a view with which I have to be honest and say I don't personally agree. I think we can have a great influence on prevention of mental ill health if we have the kind of dialogues you've talked about with communities. So could I take go talk to you, Myra, about what do you think we should be doing in mental health services and services like your own to engage with communities? The first thing that comes to mind, thank you for the question, Jodie. Mm. The first thing that comes to mind very often is actually what's the relationship between mental health services and the communities? Yep. Because kind of following on really from what Alison was saying, very often the mental health problem or issue itself is located within the individual and therefore responsibility for it is located within the individual. So mental health services then have a relationship in which, with, with communities and with clients or patients, in which it's the community is holding then the responsibility of mental health within their community, for which then a mental health service then is having a, a relationship with, um, with that community or client by saying, when you have a problem or when you feel like you're struggling, come and see us. I mean, that's obviously in a very generic, um, yeah. in a nutshell kind of way of a relationship. Yeah. But in doing so then, the problem with that then is that with that responsibility being within the community, communities then are then branded as hard to reach. And I don't ever agree with that sense of communities being hard to reach. Um, you need to look at my diary and the clients I work with to know that um, any client coming from a ethnic minority background, they are not hard to reach. Um, but what happens, though, is the relationship between a mental health service with the community in placing all the responsibility on the community means that it takes a huge amount of effort and autonomy and ability and hope and faith for anybody, any individual client then, to actually then reach out to a mental health service. So I think actually what we need to do is take back the responsibility of supporting our communities from the community itself and back into the mental health services. What is the responsibility that mental health services themselves need to hold on to in order then to um, offer services then that are culturally and face sensitive to communities. 
It also leads on to a second point, which again, which again, a few people have mentioned today already, which is, but again, by locating mental health within a community and within an, or, and within within individuals, we're then coming from a position in which we are then placing mental health and communities in a vacuum that is separate to society. And then what immediately gets ignored as well then is our lived experience of being in the world. And for ethnic minority, ethnic minorities and communities and clients, we have particular experiences around all the prejudices, racisms, and all the trauma that comes from that and historical trauma that these communities have lived through. That all of those things then are being completely ignored yet they're having an impact on mental health, but they seem to be separated and split from mental health. So, so I think it's a combination of those two things. We have communities that are holding responsibility for their mental health. Then on top of that, we're ignoring historical and current racial trauma that they're also experiencing. So I think it's a combination of those two things for me that we need to really understand and, and work on. So in a sense, what you're saying, Myra, and it's a theme that other speakers have raised, is when we are having conversation with individuals who do come forward or are referred forward, we need, and Raj mentioned this, we need to be asking about racial trauma and we need to also have communication with the communities to kind of understand their perspective. I mean, if I can, uh, and the question is, how do we do that? And let me just give, a, I don't often give personal anecdotes, but when I had my first consultant post, which was in 1988, and I moved to a part of London where there were Asian communities, and I'd previously trained at SLAM with people from African and African, predominantly African and African Caribbean communities. And I was just in complete, I think, shock, really, at having people coming to the outpatient clinic who, because of the nature of their culture, walking down streets had had their hair set fire to. And the hair had been set fire to because they were different to the other people in that community. And they had already suffered the whole trauma of being an asylum seeker and all the damage. And I remember one person who had a little brother who at Christmas wanted a bike and all my grandchildren and I with bikes was the big thing and scooters. So for little guys, just having your bike to move in, around is a real present. But the only place this woman who came seeking help because of her fire, hair being set on fire was that her brother had to wheel his little bike up and down their hall because it was too terrifying to think of the trauma they would suffer like her if they were allowed outside the front door. And then another person from the same community, where because of the economic damage they felt would be done to that family's whole perspectives, if anybody were to have a diagnosis of mental ill health in that family, the, the issue was put forward by the local health practitioners as this is a case of low thyroid function. It's nothing to do with depression. That's a psychiatric term. This is about low thyroid function. And I'm just, I suppose my questions are, are these the kind of could we have, I had nowhere in those days to have those discussions. There wasn't a forum to bring it to. Do we think, you know, thinking about Alison as a trainee, attendee, are there places that you feel in your professional lives you could bring these difficult, challenging issues from different communities to talk about it in an open way, not denigrating the communities, but trying to think about how could this now be included into the types of treatments and therapies and attitudes that are around? Alison, would you, if you were a new, you know, next year, a new consultant going into an area where there's different cultures to the ones that you're used to working with, would you feel safe? Would you feel that there was now a place that you could have these type of conversations? Or would you be like me, just in shock? Mm, I think that is such a powerful and powerful story that you told. Um, because that, that's what I realised. I was hearing all these issues. I was having all these experiences myself and I didn't know where to bring that and obviously we have our bailing groups which is a, a space where you as a group of trainees can talk about um, cases that have stuck with you but that's not necessarily a place where you learn how you can move forward with that within within the sense of how am I going to treat this person how am I going to help this person get through this difficult point in their life um, so I think 
if I was a new consultant, hopefully I will be a consultant next year, um, is that actually we need to be creating these spaces within the teams that we work in. So already now we're starting to have the talking points through what Arlene mentions, uh, time to talk, which have been great spaces, but actually we need them to have them within our teams because that's where the work is happening with our um, with, with the people people that we serve and if those conversations aren't happening within those teams then actually I think we'll still be stuck and we still won't be moving forward and that's where we need to go and I think having that real openness that Ade was talking about not being scared we, we, we all have different views different understandings um, but unless we have a safe space where we can talk about that and bring these issues I don't think they will be resolved. Okay, Yutundi, and I'm so sorry I called you Addy, just picking up the end bit of your name rather than the first bit, my apologies. So how would you answer my question? Okay, so um, I guess when you were telling your story, I was moved by the vulnerability um, of the story and of the people. And so for me, one of the things that perhaps we don't do well at is vulnerability, whether you're a human being, whether you're a practitioner, it doesn't matter whether you're a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor, whatever it is, a, you know, a, a service um, provider. Um, we don't tend to focus in on that experience that we have. Um, certainly we can create spaces, um, but the spaces, you know, just like Alison was saying, can exist with teams. But at the same time, I think that those um, spaces in order to have these conversations should exist everywhere. Because what the danger, or, or in my experience, the danger is we can create silos where we feel safe um, to explore these issues. For example, um, you know, 10 years ago, I set up the Black and Asian Counseling Psychology Group, not because I was particularly interested in running a group or setting up a group, but it was in response to not having a safe place to talk about my experiences on training, but also my professional identity and how that crossed over with my personal identity. And I know that Myra had mentioned earlier that one of the important things to her was around intersectionality. And so, you know, being able to have these spaces that we have created, but also opening it up to a wider audience so that I can have a conversation with Myra, I can have a conversation with Alison or, um, or Raj or uh, Aileen, um, and we can actually challenge ourselves in, in, in the way that we think. One of the things that I'm a bit mindful of, and I, can, I guess I kind of want to share my thought on this, is language. I feel that we talk a lot about this and that and the other, but actually we intellectualize um, how we speak often. And I think that creates a barrier between communities. Um, you know, when you talk about things like target, well, what does actually target mean? I don't want to be targeted. Why do I want to be targeted? What I want is accessibility. I want to be able to access help when and if I need it. I don't want to be targeted. And, I, and so when we're talking about targeting communities or, you know, placing the responsibility onto communities, I think for me, this is part of the um, barrier in people actually coming forward and asking for help. Um, the other thing I picked up on, um, which I kind of wanted to respond to a little bit, was around um, shared power. Um, hmm. Power is a fantastic thing, isn't it? Um, for me, <laughs> personally, the way that I was brought up, I was brought up to appreciate that everybody has power and that sometimes it may be difficult for people to utilize that power, but the ability to speak my voice and to speak my truth is power. I may not necessarily be the president of the United States or you know, the, uh, the, um, the prime minister of, of uh, uh, the, the United Kingdom, but actually I do have power. And what we want to encourage people is to tap into their own power rather than, Sorry, I have a thing about language. We talk a lot about, I want to empower somebody. Well, for me personally, that suggests that that person doesn't have power and that we are therefore going to bestow power on them. Well, actually we need to reframe the way that we're thinking about that. Everybody has power. What we want to do is to encourage people to be able to utilize it, even though at the moment they're not able to tap into it. So right now I have the power to utilize my voice, whereas somebody else doesn't by sitting on this panel. I'm in a privileged position to be the chair of a division within the British Psychological Society. That is my power, but that doesn't actually mean I have power to make changes. Right. So I kind of want I, I wanted to invite people to think about things a little bit differently um, in terms of the way that we create space 
in terms of the way that we utilize language, in terms of the way that we engage with, with, with communities. And hopefully maybe that those are little actions, but little actions that um, can be combined to, to move the conversation and the position forward. What we don't want to be doing is in 10 years time, ex having this exact you know, uh, um, discussion. Okay, thank you so much. Myra, do you have a response to some of the, the, the language that our colleagues have spoken about and the, the kind of the need to have a different type of consultation? One of the, the questions that's coming up in the chat repeatedly from people listening in, uh, of which there are 117 people, just to let you know, is how can we improve access to services for people from a whole range of, of cultures? How, rather than wait, and we'll come back to Raj about rather than wait till people are detained under the Mental Health Act or are presenting in crisis, what should we be doing to, to make services more accessible and unfearful for people at this point? Yeah, I, what, I'm, what I'm kind of really kind of tapping into is I, I deliver training on, on working, um, and what I say, working within diversity. So very often training is delivered in which it's a bolt on, it's a tick box, it's that tokenism that Yutunde spoke about earlier. Yeah. For me, it is about how do we create services from the very core of what they're trying to offer that is inclusive, but is also um, sensitive to the identities and the lived experiences and the truth of the capital T, the truth of the clients and patients that we are working with and supporting. And I'm thinking about all the training that I deliver then, which is around how do we, first of all, understand our own sense of self and identity individually and the terminology and the language we use ourselves and from our own lived experience and truth. Um, and how is that then informing the, um, the services then? How, how is that having both conscious and unconscious impact and influence then on, the, on our profession, on our practice and on the services we're creating that then reach out? And, and, and again, I appreciate you today said it now, that some of them do actually do target particular communities. Um, so for me, it's about we need to be able to look at mental health services and at their core, come from a place of working within diversity because we are always working cross-culturally with every single client and patient we work with we are working cross-culturally because no one no other individual is exactly like me and whereas this idea of a service having an, an identity that's homogenous and then going out and working then with a community that has some kind of homogenous identity we're always going to miss the mark and it goes back to them this this thing around in understanding complex identities, we then need to take into account then how every single person we support and work with, how are, how are they experiencing life and what might be impacting on them? Again, it's that piece around intersectionality, but it leads into, and I can see comments in the chat around, you know, us mm. being um, with cultural, you know, working with cultural humility, um, being trauma informed. But again, though, it's about at a core, our training, something that I've been calling on all year, is that being trauma-informed and working within diversity needs to be a core condition and a core aspect of within our training and then within the services that we offer so that it then removes, I think, actually quite a few barriers that are created because we don't do that, because we don't look and we don't acknowledge and we don't honour the lived experiences of, of, of any individual from, from any community that, that they come from. I, thank you very, very much. That's really, really thought-provoking um, interaction. I have had the huge privilege over many years to work with amazing psychologists. I worked in Oxley's NHS Trust, and we, you know, we have people with just huge experience of working with people who have been traumatized, physical, sexual, emotional abuse, or all uh, have suffered asylum um, kind of interventions and, and circumstances. And I suppose my question is, how do we separate off racial trauma, trauma due to race, from people's life trauma? And as a psychiatrist who's always taken a, I, you know, what is the joy of this person? How lucky are we as mental health professionals to be able to work with people 
who come to us and trust us enough to tell them, tell us their stories, how do we find out what their resilience characteristics are? What are their own resilience that they tap into? Yes, people have been traumatized, but I think picking up your point, um, uh, Yutundi, about not feeling that we should empower people, how should we be assessing people? How should we be working with people that always systematically taps into what is it that you do that you is one of your major strengths? What are the opportunities you want? What are the major dreams that you have? How have you lived through? What, what resilience strengths have you got for living through the circumstances you've been in? I would say for my own personal resilience toolkit, which is kind of quite huge since I'm still battling around in the statutory world for the last 45 years, many of my own personal high resilience techniques have come from listening to my patients, my experts by experience, some of the wonderful trainees and the wonderful cultures I've worked with. So Raj, you have a major role in promoting wonderfully social psychiatry inequalities at, at, the, at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. What do you think we should be doing, both in terms of training but in also the personalization, the listening to the real person, whatever culture they come from, how, how do you think we can change that in a way that will hopefully reduce the use of the Mental Health Act? I think you're on mute. Uh, thank you for that, Geraldine. I think it's a really uh, big question you're asking. You know, how do you make a difference? It's a really huge question. And, you know, if I go back to what I said earlier, I genuinely believe that, you know, a lot of work needs to be done, which is upstream to where we operate. I will exp uh, I have a, um, a statement, a declaration, because I work in rehabilitation, which means that somebody that hasn't just come through the system and come yeah. to my service... Yeah. They've actually been in the system for a number of years, and that's a unique thing. So the average number of admissions someone's had is around 10, and it, they've been in the system for at least 15 years. So one yeah. thing I wanted to say is that every contact with the mental health services under the Mental Health Act, when police come to your doorstep uh, with doctors and social workers, you're bundled into a, an ambulance in front of all your neighbours, taken to hospital, admitted, and then, you know, things get a bit better. You're taken off the section and you're discharged and you're allowed to go, go back to your own address from which you were taken away. If it was me, I would be mortified going back there. You know, I've already experienced stigma as somebody with mental health problems, but to go back there and know that all my neighbors looking at me, knowing that I was dragged away in that way, I don't know what condition I would have been in at the time. So, so they have been through this type of thing multiple times and then, they come to a rehabilitation setting. And I think um, in most rehabilitation services, we do use a strength-based approach. We do dip into people's um, skills and aspirations and what they used to do, what they like to do, and we make sure that those things are all facilitated. So we started a, a system on our ward where we get uh, people to chair their own meetings. And this is one of the... It's a small thing to start with, but what happens is that Nobody gets interrogated during their clinical meeting or CPA. They get to ask questions. So it's, it's, it's an enabling type of experience. And it's new to many people. And um, I know, Geraldine, you've come to our ward on one occasion and, and sat in one of these uh, CPA meetings. So that's one of the ways in which you actually put uh, them, the individual, as, as, a, as a human being, but in charge of their treatment to make decisions. But you do need the rest of the system to work with it. So every conversation needs to be about that person. You need to start by asking, you know, what are the things you want us to do for you? That's the kind of thing. How can I help you or what can I do for you today would be the question rather than everything being coercive or inflicted on an individual. This improves somebody's uh, perception of themselves. It, it, it allows them to take some control over the immediate things that they have to deal with, which might be being on a ward uh, against their will. But you do need to give people uh, the ability or the opportunity to be themselves. So the word empowering, I totally agree with. It's, it's a very kind of passive, it's a colonial type thing. Um, and, and what you need to do is to allow people to exercise their power in whichever way possible. 
But having worked in that end of the spectrum, I'm really talking about you know, us eliminating and really being cognizant of every single factor that le leads a person to getting in through the front door of the psychiatric hospital. And I've just seen a question about, you know, um, your personal impressions of how racism affects mental health of black and other ethnic minority patients. And the point I wanted to say is that the word racism is used broadly, and I don't know how different people define it. You may think about individual acts of somebody calling you a name or assaulting you on the street as a, an individual act of racism. But what we really, really need to think about is the structural aspect of racism, because this is the disadvantage you have in terms of housing, in terms of opportunities. You go to a job interview, you don't get that. You have to adjust and adapt your uh, aspirations and expectations of your life. So in that context, your resilience is a good word, but it's not, it's not enough. It's not the same resilience as somebody from a white background has to go through when they go for a job. I've just seen um, some uh, uh, stats from the Royal College of Physicians, which says that um, black and ethnic minority doctors, when they apply for their first consultant job, are much less likely to get the job than a white candidate. This is systemically built into the structures that we have. You know, and you can't pinpoint where it started. It may have started when you were young, you may have been getting free school meals, but there are so many people out there who will never have to think about the free school meals. I didn't want to finish today without mentioning that because it is all part of the structural inequality we live in. So I suppose we have to work at every single level, but we really need to turn our attention towards prevention because if we don't do that. There is, you know, there's only so much money that's going into mental health systems and we can't be using all that money to lock up all these BME people yeah. We do need to address the root cause. Okay. Geraldine, can I just come in there very quickly? Just to... <laughs> Absolutely great. Yeah, go for it. Um, th there's two things that I kind of want to um, pick up. Um, the first thing, you know, just following from um, the conversation is that we also have to think about the services that we provide and the funding available for the services. Often um, there are grassroots um, com uh, organizations that want to do work with communities, but there is never enough funding allocation for these um, organizations to do the work appropriately. So again, that taps into the structural discrimination where, you know, the L London Borough of so-and-so might say, well, we've got, mm -hmm. you know, five million um, pounds available for uh, BME quote-unquote work, but actually they're only um, delegating 30,000 of a five million fund to grassroots organizations. How are we expected to do work when there's not enough funding to do that work. And then the other thing I picked up from the, sh from the chat, following on from, from um, um, something mm -hmm. you'd mentioned was around, how do we separate off or recognize what uh, racial trauma is from trauma associated with the rest of life? For me personally, as a practitioner, I don't think that works. Um, and the reason is that, you know, you have to look at it in a holistic way that you can't say, well, this is racial trauma and that this is how that impacts me. And this is the rest of the trauma in my life. And this is how it impacts me. I think that creates and fosters uh, uh, segregation within the self. And when actually what we want to do is to um, navigate and negotiate within ourselves, the identities that we carry and the trauma that we have to work with. I think, you know, in, in terms of, you know, how how do you define racism? We talk a lot about how social, uh, racism is socially constructed and, you know, there's so many other biological definitions or not, not non-biological definitions. The fact is, regardless of definition, racism exists and it impacts different communities in different ways. And therefore, that is the acknowledgement that we need in order to move forward. You know, it doesn't matter whether somebody calls me a horrible name or I am overlooked for a promotion that actually I have worked quite hard to um, want to want to achieve and, and deserve and to be told, oh, because you're a, a single black mother, um, this is not the ideal position for you at this moment in time. That is microaggression <laughs> and it exists. And so it doesn't matter. I guess what I'm wanting us to get away from is, the, is this idea of definition. It doesn't matter. The fact is there is a, a an impact on us as individuals, but on us as a community. And if if we keep focusing on, oh, like Raj said earlier, whether racism exists or doesn't exist, we're never going to move on to a conversation as to what, what can we do to make this better for people. Yes, absolutely. Very passionate. Great. So 
One of the things you've all mentioned is about the, the facts are very, very clear. We have big challenges, big issues. We have structural racism. We have inequalities. One of my questions to you all is, are we, is there actually agreement about the facts? So if I give you one issue, one of the issues that keeps coming up in the chat is people saying, so how can we make uh, services better for people with crisis? How can we actually encourage people who are in a crisis to come and seek help early? I, we have for section 136, so for people picked up appearing to be mentally unwell um, in the streets and brought to places of safety, whether it's emergency departments or mental health trusts, at the moment, 67% of those people, there is no recording of ethnicity. So we're trying to design one of the most important parts of the system based on almost no real information about who's coming from which cultures at which point. So if we wanted to design a much more responsive, proactive system, we haven't actually got that kind of a data. So can I just throw at you all, if we are to take this agenda practically forward, is it acceptable to have the current situation where we really have very, very random levels of just the basic information about who is coming to use services and what their outcomes are? Myra, do you have a view? Are your services better at? Yeah, what I'm really struck by, and I think it goes back to the point that Yutunde and other people in the chat were making around, around identity and this holistic nature. And for me, it goes back to how are we, if, yeah, so if we're creating services that do actually support and work with and um, help, help people in that holistic way, then from step one, we need to actually acknowledge the identity, you know, it's assessment level, we need to acknowledge the identity and the lived experience and the truth of that individual. And we cannot take, take on board and we cannot work with their truth and their lived experience if we don't acknowledge the world in which they live in. Again, there's this idea of us treating them at a homogenous level. People, whether it's um, in the mental health system or me working privately as a therapist at any place in, in when it comes to supporting mental health of, of, of our clients and patients, we cannot work in a vacuum any longer. And I, yet I feel like the profession itself is trying to locate us, the profession itself and the practice in this vacuum that then doesn't take into account people's holistic identity and then their real lived experiences. Um, because otherwise, because it, it, it creates this feedback loop that if we ignore lived experience, we ignore identity. Therefore, we're actually absolutely splitting off and dismissing and, and, and minimizing then all the different types of trauma somebody can experience, including, of course, racial trauma. I'm also thinking about the role of faith, the role of um, any other aspect of our spirituality that's also part of our culture and our faith and the rest of our lived experience and truth and sense of self as well. I feel like so many aspects of our self get sidelined. And if we don't acknowledge them from, the, from that assessment place, you know, at assessment, from the point that we have contact with anybody, with any of our clients and patients, if we ignore any aspects of that identity, we are then ignoring it in terms of their lived experience and what they're suffering or what they're in distress about, what they're traumatized by, as well as then the, the impact of that lived experience. It feels like so much just gets completely dismissed. If we ignore from, from assessment level, their identity, their holistic identity, their entire lived experience. It's something that I'm really passionate about because otherwise I will only ever be perceived because of my headscarf. I will only ever then be perceived as a Muslim woman and that's it. And I go, hold on a minute, there's so much more to me than, than that in terms of my identity. And yet for so many communities that we support, we are treating them as this single siloed homogenous label that is either their race not their ethnicity, but their race, which is even more problematic, yep. or perhaps um, an ethnicity or perhaps a faith group. And yet we know that for so many, for all of us, in fact, not even for some of us, for all of us, we have this very integrated identity. 
And we need to start acknowledging that within the profession and the profession itself then needs to integrate that into not only our professional practice, but yeah. from the very beginning of our training, because it parallels, the training gets paralleled then in, in our clinical rooms. Yes. So it's this really holistic um, approach that we need to take as a profession, but also a holistic approach we need to take with the communities and the clients that we work with. Okay, thank you so much. So we have literally three minutes left to go. And so what we've heard today is we need to, training is absolutely vital. Having safe spaces for open conversations about communities, about cultures, about equalities, about race, but also about our clinical practice and about the experiences of our workforce. We have to get it in the open and be able to talk about it. But can I just ask each of you for one if you had a top thing that you think would shift the dial sustainably, so this won't go away, what one thing would you think we should be focusing on? What would be at the top of your list? I'm sure you all have about 10 things, but what would be at the top of your list of this you think would be in your lifetime going forward, one of the most important things that would actually change things? Arlene. As I said, um, talk about race. We need to talk about it. We're trying to get um, and engage with our communities and, and, and provide a service. But if when they do come into the service, um, they're still going to experience racism anyway. We as um, clinicians, staff, we need to sort out our own issues because yeah. if we can't look at each other and you know, then we're going to have the same issue when we're teach, um, um, treating our, our clients. So, yeah. Thank you. That is absolutely great. So take that into Black Lives Matter, into our Time to Talk movement. We need the same thing for practitioners. Uh, Alison, what, what's at the top of your agenda? Just one point. Oh, so hard. Um, can I squeeze into, I think, co-production, really listening, really actually listening yeah. to our communities and that feeding into our training and what they feel is important, as well as having that open space to speak, but having, um, because we did, as part of our cultural um, psychiatry group, we did a survey and actually many trainees felt like they couldn't talk to their uh, seniors, they couldn't talk to their consultants about these issues. And actually, unless that's coming from the top, that space is created. I think that's going to be key. Fantastic. Uh, Raj, last word from you. Yes, I think um, one thing would be for all of us to be reflecting and seriously thinking about what would help you earn the trust of the people that you're meant to serve. If you ask them, what would help you come to us uh, asking for help? If you could answer that question for yourself based on your experience, I think we would have a start. What it a has to be an honest one. What a fantastic question to include in every assessment. Absolutely brilliant. Yutunde, what's your last point? We've got f literally 50 seconds left, so I'm really sorry. <laughs> That's all right. I've got three. Accountability. Yep. Why, and the question around why, we need to ask ourselves why we don't listen when people talk. Why do people have to resort to violence before we listen? Um, the other thing I wanted to mention very quickly is around cultural competency. Cultural competency in this context does not work. Cultural yep. sensitivity, cultural, uh, cultural awareness, and I think Myra's term, cultural humility. Yes, great. Myra, last word with you. In one word, housekeeping. The profession has a lot of housekeeping to do. And Fantastic. that is, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much indeed. Fabulous panel. Absolutely wonderful. I have huge hope for the future. Thank you very much, everyone who's listened. And just to tell people from uh, the uh, recording of today and key points will be extracted by the Mosley Learning Team and will be on our YouTube channel. Also, on February the 5th is a new and very dynamic course, which I'm hugely proud to be supporting about the Mental Health Act and the use of the Mental Health Act and where culture, race, equalities fits in a whole new way of doing things. So thank you so much indeed, all of you. Thank you very much to the Mosley Learning Technical team. The future's looking good. Take care. Have a lovely afternoon. <laughs>